Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Carrie. And certainly um, everyone at the Gandhi Center, and thank you all for coming this evening in an exploration of our minds. I'm usually so sure that I have to pull it down, but I'm going to pull this up. Um, you all bring your own expertise and experience because you're bringing your brains and your uh, minds and what you have experienced with all this life in, in terms of what you see, what you hear. So we're all in this together, quite frankly. However, let me warn you, the brain you have come in with is not the brain you're going home with. <laughs> every experience, every thought changes our brain. And of course, I hope we can all leave with a new and improved model as we share an exciting evening together. I'm going to, uh, first of all, let me introduce my two colleagues and esteemed mentors. He's looking at me. See, you'll see an interaction. We've taught together for 15 years. I was a student years ago at Stanford. And Dr. Carl Prebrum is, as most of you know, and thank goodness we have websites to know, carlhprebrum.com because otherwise I would be spending three hours introducing Dr. Prebrum and Dr. Cock. So I'm just going to give you a great overview because we are so privileged tonight to have neuroscientists, probably the leading neuroscientists of the 20th century. However, he's come into the 21st century and is continually learning and adding to what we are learning about neuroscience, cognitively, about our brains, about our behavior. He just doesn't stop learning, researching, and bringing things together. What an inspiration. I have been privileged to teach with Dr. Prebrum for the last 15 years at Georgetown University. He was his student years ago at Stanford. And how many of us have the privilege of being in the same room with two of our mentors? Dr. Prebrum is my esteemed mentor, as is Srimati Kamala, my mentor, my spiritual mentor. So I feel very privileged and grateful this evening and excited about what we can all experience together. Dr. Prebrum started out as a neurosurgeon in the 1940s, that was 1940 and has gone on to research every part of the brain. He's been a maverick, as many of you know, in terms of what he says about the brain. He talked about the holonomic aspects of the human brain when most neuroscientists were still dealing with only physical and the matter, the physical part of the brain. And now technology is catching up with a lot of what, not only the Vedic wisdom, the wisdom of Dr. Prebrum as well. And we're bringing this together because as you will see over the evening, we are just tapping into, they're aligning much of what neuroscience is understanding, researching, and discovering with Vedic tradition. And speaking of Vedic tradition, <laughs> you know, it's it, Dr. Koch, it's, um, it's an irony almost for me to say he's a Renaissance man because, in fact, he is not only head of computer science uh, program, he's a quant he understands quantum physics, neuro, uh, all of the neural networks, he understands ontology. I just put a few of those down. He's a man of so much and a very esteemed Vedic scholar. We have in the library several of his books. One is The Cradle of Civilization. So he is the leading scholar to bring all of this together as well. We are very fortunate this evening. So we will, again, he has a website so you can see his many publications. His, I'm going to tell you a little secret, which I'm not going to say it very well. And he told me not to tell you. <laughs> but. A number of years ago, there was an unsolved mathematical problem. 
unsolved since Einstein. Now, he is also a mathematician, and very likely he solved it. Now, we can talk about that later, that may be controversial, he didn't want me to tell you, but this shows you <laughs> the breadth and the intellect of this man, and yet both of these gentlemen are extraordinary human beings. And that's what it's really important, isn't it? Now, we're going to turn that off pretty soon because you may be wondering, no, just because um, we met in the 60s, we, we're not doing psychedelic <laughs> stuff to see if we can get any um, <coughs> meditation does the same, by the way. Um, we're going to turn this off, but before we do, this is Dr. Carl Preer. We didn't, those are his brain waves. So, at age 75, he was the first to show that in fact, and these are EEGs, and we'll talk about that or not, but once again, ahead of other neuroscientists to show that the, our brains, no matter how old we are, no matter what we're doing, change up to 200 times a second. See all of that movement there? So if you woke up this morning and you felt you were brain locked, yeah. you weren't. You just hadn't attached to the rest of it. Uh, it so all of us, the, that's why I say the brain is changing all of the time based on what you think and what you're doing. Remember when you see this, we can turn it off both, but when, when you see researchers' MRIs and they say, this is the part of the brain, such and such happens, this is the part of the brain that when you're anxious it lights up. It, there's blood there for a certain amount of time and that's very helpful. The fMRI and many of the other scanning devices we are using now gives us a great deal of information about the brain. However, it does not give us the dynamic. It does not give us the layers of the brain. What happens in those layers of the brain? Culture and experience help shape our everyday brain mind experience. For example, I know a Ghanaian friend of mine at the World Bank named Isaac tells me that when he was young, he used to walk along the river, and if there was a stick in the river, he would become the stick. And it was very easy for him to do, or in breathing, he would become his breath. And he said, this isn't unusual. My whole community can do that. However, when he started, came to the West, and he studied economics and Western thought, he can no longer do it. I would like each of you to think of how your brain, even when you were a child, or what your child may have told you, what you were capable of doing, or within your culture, what is an everyday assumption. And then perhaps Western science thought, oh, no, that's not really happening, because that's another approach, or a material approach. When I was little, I used to entertain myself by, by I would think a thought. Then I would, be, I would think that I was thinking the thought. And then I would be aware that I was thinking that thinking the thought. I could go back about 10 times from the thought. It's like a mirror almost, the ladder. Today I can go back maybe two times, <laughs> two levels. I can't do it anymore. But I used to do that, especially if I was not feeling very good or if I wanted, because I'd end up giggling because I'd keep going back and back and back. What about those layers of the brain? In 1974, at Stanford University, Dr. Ernest Hilgard, who was the head of the psychology department there, and then later on, um, textbook and happened to have been a very good friend and mentor of Dr. Carl Prebrum. Now, I knew him as Dr. Ernest Hilgard, mm -hmm. Professor Hilgard. Carl calls him Jack. Just like when we teach our class, he refers to Fred Skinner because he knows them all. He's known them all. He's worked with them all. And he not only brings a history of the brain and all of his research, but an understanding of how this has come together. 
the Hilgards were doing research in hypnosis at the time. And they hypnotized a man to not feel pain in his hand. And then they came up with the question, but is there someone, something inside that can feel the pain? That knows we're, what we're doing here? He's just kind of, ah, you know, he's hypnotized, he doesn't feel the pain, he's sitting there. And so the question was posed, is there an entity somewhere that knows he's being hypnotized and knows everything that's going on, even though the man didn't seem to at the time? And if you are there, please, this is a raise your right index finger very slowly. And then raised his right index finger. He did not know that something inside, a deeper part. Isn't that Vedic wisdom? Isn't this talking about the layers of the mind? And as a hypnotherapist, how do you call upon that? Guess what? Very simple. If somebody's hypnotized, you simply call upon that part to help. You can, I can call upon it to help with what's going on. So there are layers. We're just learning about this. We're exploring it, and Western science is just beginning to appreciate it. So what are those layers, and who is the thinker, and what do we mean by consciousness? Well, even though we've used the word consciousness, and we will, remember semantics are difficult. And in fact, are we talking about consciousness as being conscious and unconscious? Are we talking about the Vedic, the larger consciousness? And there are some scientists now looking inside the brain, trying to find the little material part of the brain that is responsible for consciousness. What do you think the answer is? Do you think they'll find it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to talk about one or two, well, one, they are finding, however, that there's a part of the brain, and this is only in this decade. The same thing that Dr. Prebram was doing in, in the, the waves of the brain, and that is basically, there's a persistent level of background activity they have found in the brain. That even when somebody's resting, something else is happening. Now, not only that, and they call it default mode network. So never fear. Your brain is always going. In fact, it's going a great deal. Even if you feel that you're not, you may be taking a nap. And if you're taking a nap, your brain is going, using 20 times more energy than when you snap up and try to knock that fly off your cheek. They even call it black energy because the scientists are saying, where did this come from? There's this deep default part of the brain that's going on all the time. So even Western science is now dealing with this. What else about Western science that I just want to share with you that has happened recently, but is no surprise, of course, Dr. Uh, Jag Hanwell, those of you who came to our last lecture on, on our book, he was my co-author, who our colleague at Georgetown has found, along with other scientists, that sound is right next to and associated with the neurons of the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain. Sound, vibrations of sound, is that thing about? Not only that, in the brain, the amygdala again, they found, but I'm sure there are other parts, the same neuron responsible, associated with emotion, also is associated not only with heart rate, but associated with respiration, breathing, pranayama. Does that sound familiar? Western science is now, even in material ways, finding and recognizing the same thing. Now, Dr. Koch is going to go into great detail about some of this, and certainly Dr. Krieger. Um, light, circadian rhythms, biorhythms, 
in our lives. Everything in our whole body, our body clock, our circadian rhythms, our trillion rhythms are affected by light and dark. Tides, nature, harmony. And there's a lot of research done now in the last 10 years which explicitly shows how this happens. And by the way, I must say, it does show that in the United States and other, a few other uh, urban areas, or many of us have our biorhythms quite scrambled. And that's the reason for bipolar, depression. I'm a clinical psychologist. By the way, when I people come into me, I say it's either medication or meditation. Now, I'm certified to give medication, but I take them off and teach them about meditation. And there's going to be a Kriya series here right after Easter, every Wednesday night from 7.30 to 8.30. Meditation is extremely important. Of course. My father would have said, it's good for what ails you. But it doesn't even have to ail you if you meditate. You can go through the literature and it just becomes more and more obvious how important meditation is in every part of our brain and every part of our working body and, and how it not only helps our memory, our mood, our functioning, our heart rate, everything else. Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin, one of my favorite research, he has shown that in fact meditation changes the architecture of the brain. The left frontal lobe increases. So when you have emotion in the emotional part of the brain and it's, it's jazzed up as it comes to the frontal lobes which make decision and deal with what am I going to do with all of this, it's almost like a dam. Keeping the energy, keeping the agitation even keeping it all in harmony and slowing it down. We could have, maybe we will have, and you will certainly, Sri Monte Kamala, uh, go on about the importance of meditation as you constantly teach us so much. But I'm just reminding you, mainstream science now has the technology to show Many of the things that many of you have known or learned, certainly the Vedic tradition has taught in every phase of life. 